Thank you all so much for joining us here at the Comedy Theatre for tonight's Wheeler Centre event on the alt-right. I've never seen a pun that has made me happier than that one. That's a, that's a very good moment. I'm Michael Williams, I'm director of the Wheeler Centre. I'd like to acknowledge we're on the land of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people, their elders past and present, and the members of any other communities that might be here tonight. For me, an acknowledgement of country is always about acknowledging that the moral and legal implications of invasion remain unresolved to this day. I'm going to sit because I don't know what to do with my arms. So I'm going to just so talk amongst yourselves. OK, that bit's done. That was less awkward than I was worried about. Uh, now, I don't know if you've noticed, but outside these four walls, outside this spectacular theatre, everything's gone to hell in a handbasket. It's, it's pretty shit out there. Bad people are doing bad things and they're getting away with it. And so I imagine you're all here because, like me, you take refuge in the words of wonderful writers. And we have four extraordinary writers with us this evening. Britt Bennett's debut novel, The Mothers, was one of my highlights of last year. Uh, it was an extraordinary debut. It wouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who'd followed her essays before that. She is one of the National Book Foundation's 2016 Five Under 35 honorees. She is 26, for those keeping score at home. Uh, her 2014 essay for Jezebel, I Don't Know What To Do With Good White People, was unflinching and incendiary. It was also shared and read more than 1.6 million times. I should reassure you, Britt, this is a Wheeler Centre crowd. There's not a single good white person here. <laughs> they are deeply unpleasant. Please give her a very unpleasant Melbourne welcome. <laughs> to her immediate left is John Saffron. Uh, John burst into the public imagination as an absolute first-rate stirrer of shit. Uh, it has to be said. A documentary filmmaker whose willingness to talk about topics like religion or uh, race, topics that any respectable Australian avoids talking about at any cost, uh, marked him as someone to watch. But he's gone respectable, he has a beard now, and he writes books instead of uh, being rude to people on the television. Uh, but he's uh, not shying away from unflinching and uncomfortable subjects. His new book is called Depends What You Mean by Extremist. Please make him very welcome. Now, one of the things I know about John is he is an obsessive and very competitive Scrabble player, and I'm kind of kicking myself that we didn't set up tonight as this kind of showdown between John Saffron and our next guest, Roxanne Gay, who can do a thing or two on the tiles, I understand. <laughs> that came out worse when I said it out loud. In my head it was fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, whatever Roxanne turns her gaze and her writerly skills to is razor sharp and as incisive as it is insightful. Uh, whether it's her novel, An Untamed State, her celebrated collection of essays, Bad Feminist, her latest collection of short stories, Difficult Women, or her upcoming memoir, Hunger, not to mention graphic novels, comics, any number of things, also just taking down trolls on Twitter. Whatever she does, she does it with aplomb, and uh, she's deeply compassionate and has a strong sense of justice. Please welcome Roxanne Gay. And to my far right, and politically, no, no, <laughs> I, I can't follow that with anything. George Saunders is a celebrated and revered author of several collections of short stories, and most recently a novel, The Remarkable Lincoln in the Bardo. He's also, through that work and through a number of essays and speeches and other places, become a kind of poet laureate of empathy somehow. His uh, much-read, much-shared commencement speech for Syracuse University was a call for kindness, and it was classic Saunders. It was smart, it was witty, it was provocative, it was deeply moving, and it turns out that it was very much a call for kindness uh, that's time had come. We live in an age where, apparently, empathy is a pretty radical concept mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one worth fighting for. George did an interview for ABC Radio National today on Facebook, and the caption underneath him throughout uh, described him as a acclaimed US author and Trump critic. So apparently, <laughs> being a critic of Trump is as important as being one of the extraordinary writers of his age. Please welcome George Saunders. Thanks. Now, I might start with you, Britt, um, because I read an interview you, with you where you said that uh, in no small way you uh, owed your success as a writer 
to writing about the Black Lives Matters movement. And that was both professionally incredibly exciting, but personally incredibly sad, that bittersweet thing that this was the subject that catapulted you into attention. Right, well, thank you for this introduction. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah, it's something that I still feel very ambivalent about. Um, you know, I'd been working on this novel for a long time, and at the point at which I wrote the Good White People essay, it was something that I just wrote sort of quickly one afternoon um, because I was very frustrated with what was happening um, with American police violence. And it was an essay that I did not expect to blow up in the way that it did. Um, I didn't expect to have reporters calling me to, to interview me about it. Um, and it was strange to have been uh, working and, and trying to get attention of agents and trying to get people to care about your writing and to have people care about it, but through these really sort of uh, dark circumstances. So it's something that, that I knew that there wasn't a causal link between those two, but it, it was sort of bittersweet to feel proud of your success when your success was due to writing about something that, that um, is truly tragic. Mm. I, I mean, you wrote it in two hours. The writers across this theater who are just gnashing their teeth and want to <laughs> jump up here and throttle you for that. But two hours and fueled by frustration and a sense of grief and anger, were they registers you brought to your writing before? You know, I don't, I don't know, actually. I mean, it, I, I'm not really a nonfiction writer. I'd been working on fiction for longer than I'd ever worked on nonfiction, and it was a form that I didn't even think I was particularly good at. Um, but I just, I remember I had a, um, I was sort of ranting with a friend because this, this white girl we knew in grad school, she was congratulating herself for, for not calling the police on these black students who were partying with loud music. And she was like, yeah, like, this is my contribution um, by, by not calling the police because I knew what could happen if I had called the police. And I was just thinking to myself, like, we live in a college town. Like, all of these kids are obnoxious. All of them are partying with loud music all the time. You don't get a cookie for that. Um, and, and I started ranting with, to one of my friends who is white about it, and he was like, yeah, just why don't you write something about it? So, so I think it, it came out of that, that space of frustration, but I started to think about all of these sort of connections in my own life between what was happening um, in America and the story of my own family. I have a lot of people in my family who are in law enforcement but have still been victimized by police. Mm -hmm. Roxanne, I know that you describe yourself first and foremost as a writer of fiction rather than a writer of non-fiction. Uh, why is it fiction you gravitate towards to write when clearly you have a lot of real world things you want to say? Because fiction is my first love. It's the first genre I ever wrote in. Uh, like Brit, I've been writing fiction most of my life. I'm new to non-fiction, which most people don't realize, but I wrote my first essay in like 2009. Well, not my first essay, but the first essay that really did anything um, and I wrote it in two hours, and... Um, <laughs> two hours, that's the secret. That's, yeah. yeah, that's the secret. <laughs> it was the careless language of sexual violence, and I had read this horrific story about a 10-year-old girl in Texas who had been gang raped, and the New York Times wrote an article about the town and how the town was suffering. And I thought, no, the child is suffering. And I just was moved to say something about it, and... With that, uh, the dam burst, and I realized, oh, I have a lot of opinions, and uh, <laughs> somehow people were telling me, we are interested in your opinions. Uh, so it's been an interesting, but the challenge is that my nonfiction, which is what I'm most known for, is about really difficult stuff and really depressing stuff. And that's fine, because the world is difficult and depressing right now, but that's not the entirety of my creative offerings. And it's really hard as a woman of color um, for people to expect you to be the sort of go-to for everything related to women of color. You know, today I got an email from a reporter in Sydney who um, is really invested in um, the ethics of the fashion industry. And I, so I wrote her back and I said, you know, I'm really busy and I'm going to decline because this is just not something I'm super interested in, even though I care about how our clothing is made. And she wrote back and she was like, I would really beg you to reconsider. This is a feminist issue, blah, blah, blah. And so I snapped at her over email and I was like, you were talking about clothes I'll never be able to wear. Like, this is not something I'm interested in. And so it, I, with fiction, I can write whatever I want. With nonfiction, people expect me to be a vending machine for every single liberation cause, and it's a, a lot. Yeah. The, 
you wrote that to our essay. I'm fixated on the time. I've taken longer than that on text messages. But <laughs> you wrote that essay, you said, because you were moved to write it. Yes. I mean, you write fiction because you, it's your first love and you love it. But is that the difference here? Is there a, an emotional push or a rhetorical push that was driving you to nonfiction that you think people responded to? There's a rhetorical push, absolutely. And there's an urgency with nonfiction. Like, sometimes there are things happening and I can't say nothing. Uh, for so long, especially during my 20s, I was really apathetic about pretty much everything. And I, I don't know, as I've gotten older, I've started to recognize that there are other people in the world and that there are these really serious issues that affect other people. And so I feel obligated to write about them. With fiction, I am engaging with the world as it is, but I have so much more freedom. Mm. And there's less urgency in that nobody's gonna like sit around waiting for a Roxanne Gay story. <laughs> But people generally will knock down my door for me to respond to some shit that happened three seconds ago. Uh, so, I want to I come back to that question of obligation in a minute. I just want to check, Britt, did your experience mirror Roxanne's in terms of having had such success with a single essay, people wanting you to be emblematic of bigger things, to be a spokesperson on particular topics? Were you pigeonholed as an angry woman of color? <laughs> I mean, yes, I'm certainly I'm sure not to the extent to which people hound Roxanne for these types of pieces, but I remember when Sandra Bland was killed, I had a reporter immediately ask me um, for a piece about it, and, you know, I generally feel I don't, because I think, because I feel so at home in fiction, I don't feel uh, compelled to write essays just because, um, and, you know, I felt that that story was a tragedy and I felt moved by it, but I think they expected a certain perspective from me as a black woman. And I felt like I didn't have anything new to particularly offer besides the fact that I was outraged and saddened. Um, but that the fact that I saw, I could sort of see the reporters sort of go through the like black woman Rolodex of like, okay, who can we, who can we ask? Um, which, you know, again, that's, that's not where I really necessarily see my work. Um, so I, you know, I, I think definitely not to the extent of, of people like Roxanne, but certainly I, I felt, I started to feel that I was kind of becoming somewhat of a go-to for those types of topics. John, do you think people come to you when they go to their uh, whiny provocateur politics? <laughs> Is that a... Uh, no, but because my work addresses issues, I feel... Uh, uh, you know, pe pe as soon as you bring up issues, they expect you to be very didactic and about the issues. And uh, I wanted to say, I'm going to talk about exorcisms, then I'm going to talk about John Stewart, and it's not going to make sense at the start, but then I swear it will make sense, at least in my head. That I, I once uh, spent four days with an exorcist and in America filming, and he was beating people with a Bible and everyone was writhing on the floor, including me, screaming. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great. And <laughs> then I got back to Australia and I talked to a few uh, therapists, like just non-religious people, atheists, who are like, uh, uh, what do you call the ones that aren't psychologists? No, psychologists. And, they, and I, I was expecting them to like, Diss it, you know, like be going, oh, that's ridiculous. You should kind of do regular psychology and therapy and stuff like that. That's dangerous. And they said, no, 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 it's good. It's like, because it, it's really healthy to scream and get it out. And that's like as good a way as any. That's a really good way to scream is to have an exorcism. And <laughs> I kind of feel like, like comedy writing is a, a way to scream. In, and, and, and really healthy. That's, uh, so like in, in the case of Australia at the moment, like I walk to uh, a protest around Islam and anti-Islam and there's like riot police there in this gear and there's people marching around with swastikas and there's God, then you turn on the radio and you know, there's been a terrorist attack and, you know, the terrorists left the Charlie Hebbo building, then they went to the kosher deli to target some Jews, and I'm Jewish and stuff, and all this mad stuff's going on, and I just feel like telling stories, it's sort of, yeah, it's like a, a healthy way to scream, which is a lot different to how people see satire, and that, like, for instance, Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is hilarious, so I really like him, but he's ruined everything. 
because he's created this reality for like non-comedians and the public that the the way comedy is and the purpose of comedy is you present a watertight proposition at the start and then you dot point, dot point, dot point, dot point and you have this like sealed argument that you win at the end and then the point of satire and comedy is to like take scalps, you know, like of a conservative politician and, you know, the reason Steve Colbert's so good is because they can prove, you know, you can prove that this politician lost his job and that politician lost his job or whatever. And I just think, like, sure, that's one purpose of satire and comedy, and uh, political satire and comedy, but another one is just, like, the world's really crazy and it's really unhealthy not to scream. And, like, writing comedy uh, about these things is a good way to scream. I, one of the things that I love about your work is the way it's characterised by that kind of curiosity and uncertainty, and the new book's no exception. Like, you, you resist the... Um, you resist reaching your conclusions before you've done the work, and the bullet points uh, never come in the direction that you'd expect. How much is curiosity a motivating kind of factor for you? Beyond the screen, how much of it's oh, being proven wrong? Uh, no, no, curiosity is a big thing. Like, I always am snooping around for ideas, like, well, I'll just, like, turn up to court and if I hear of something, or I'll turn up to this protest, I, and I, you know, I'll drive for an hour and a half because someone sent me a Facebook message telling me about, hey, you know this guy, and he's a murderer, and he got left out of, let out of jail, but now he's like running a horse farm over there. You should talk to him. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'll like drive <laughs> for an hour and a half, and I'll knock on his door, and I'll chat to him. He'll go, no, yeah, I don't really want to be interviewed, but we'll chat. I was like, oh, okay. So like, my, that's like kind of my life. And, 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 uh, but I've, I've noticed it's always things that are in my sphere of what I'm interested in anyway. So it is like sincere curiosity, like I'm never off sort of like to the footy or, you know, like it's, it's never something that's sort of like outside my, it's always Scrabble or, <laughs> Scrabble or, 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 or religion or, <laughs> or, or those sorts of things like that. So no, curiosity is like a, a huge bit of it. But within a particular bandwidth. Yes. George? When do you know you've got a story you want to tell and how do you decide what the right form to tell it is? Well, for me, I just, it's verbal. There, there's a voice that I can hear or uh, there'll be some funny incident or that just I can't shake loose. So my, my theory is always to start with the smallest thing, that almost like a seed crystal, a little bit of dialogue or phrase. And then the, this is the tricky part, is to try to get rid of any kind of agenda about where it's going. Just start with the phrase and play with it on a verbal level or sometimes a comic level and just wait for it to sort of reveal itself. And so that's the hard thing, especially in times like this when I, I have a lot of agendas I'd like to work on at the moment. But I know that if I do that, the, um, the pieces tend to fall a little flat. There, there's a great... Um, can I... We can swear? We can yeah. swear? Okay. Uh, the, this American poet Gerald Stern says, if you start out to write a poem about two dogs fucking and you write a poem about two dogs fucking... And you wrote a poem about two dogs fucking. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, part of the trick is I have a lot of political ideas and a lot of moral ethical ideas. And if you just do that, then you're, you've disappointed everybody. And Einstein has up, upgraded a bit and he said, um, no worthy problem is ever solved on a plane of its original conception. So if I bring my political baggage in and dump it on the reader, it's a disappointing thing. What makes the the current moment difficult for me is that there's so many things that have to be said and even if we say them really well it's probably not going to help and so to turn away from that responsibility in the name of aesthetic power seems sometimes selfish actually I think it's the only way to proceed if, if you're going to write something that isn't persuasive and lies flat on the page you might as well not do it but it, it puts a, a, a writer like me in a sort of a, a, a difficult position I think do you, I mean, is that more cut and dried when it's explicitly political baggage rather than moral or ethical baggage? I mean, if, so Lincoln and the Bardo, the image of Lincoln cradling his son was something that stayed with you and you wanted to write about. Yes. Does that immediately carry with it conclusions that you have about what that image might mean, what we might feel in confronting you? No, I mean, the hope, it, it, there's a feeling of fullness and of curiosity. You, you, ooh, that's really sparky and I don't know why that's the best case but then sometimes what happens is you say oh that's cool because of and for me when I fill in that blank the energy drops a little so the trick is to kind of keep almost like on a date you know 
you, you don't go on a date with index cards and, you know, <laughs> at 7.30, ask about her mother. You know, <laughs> you, you really want to go and see what happens, and I think that's, that's the thing. But in, in the political sense, one of the things that I have, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker about the Trump campaign and travel with them, and the tricky part was just that all these years of writing fiction has, uh, I think, somewhat trained me in this move where you occupy this side of the table very passionately, and then you run around to the other side and occupy that side, which I think is healthy for a human being, it's healthy for writing. But then when you see that on the other side of the table, there are people who are deliberately or unconsciously, whatever, doing harm, real harm, fast, uh, you kind of, you feel like you might be enabling by being too empathetic, which I don't actually believe, but I certainly had that feeling writing that piece that I'm bending over backwards to understand and rep represent people who aren't bending over backwards to understand and represent people. So but I, that was the thing I wanted to ask, is one of the great bits of analysis, possibly not great, about last year's US election was, oh, the left had a failure of empathy. They failed to understand the experience of these disenfranchised voters. And you never hear the right having that same kind of self-awareness, the right. failure of empathy to, uh, to right. people unlike themselves and ex people whose experiences don't match their own. Yeah, if, Hil if, if Hillary, if Hillary had won, you wouldn't have heard a lot of thought pieces. We should have known more about the elite yeah. that you wouldn't have read. Though, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's the thing, is empathy at some point overrated as a commodity, Brett? Oh, that's, I mean, I, I agree with what George is saying of, uh, you know, I, I feel the same way, and I think that's what the Good White People essay was about, was, was trying to strike that balance and, and trying to uh, appreciate people having good intentions. Um, as a person, I want to think about that. People, I want to like, live in a world where I think that people are in, intending good things. Um, but what do you do when faced with that reality of, you know, police are shooting unarmed people? Do their intentions matter at all? Um, so, I don't know. I... I, I I sort of struggle with that too, and I, and I think there's a way in which the sort of, you know, all of these really empathetic um, pieces about Trump voters that come out all the time, um, the fact that we are called to empathize with Trump voters, um, it's something that I definitely, uh, I'm really sick of reading and seeing, to be honest. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the idea that I am asked to empathize with a person who questions my humanity or questions my, my rights to exist or my rights to have freedom, um, that is something that I, I reject. I, I don't even know if I would consider that empathy, um, this idea that I'm sort of called to, to see myself sort of on a similar plane with someone who does not see me as an equal. Mm. Roxanne, one of the articles you wrote in the run-up to the election for the failing New York Times, sad, uh, was, uh, had the headline, uh, will this change anyone's mind? It was after one of the debates. Yeah. I mean, is that the question of someone who's trying to write in that context that you have to apply to yourself as well? No, yeah. I didn't write the headline. Ah. <laughs> True. <laughs> but Fair enough. that said... Um, Do you want to change minds, though? Yes, ideally. But I also recognise that... All of this, you know, performance of empathy, which is what it is, and trying to understand Trump voters, um, isn't about changing anyone's minds. It's really about explaining or justifying racism. And I, I want no part in that. But I do want to reach people who are reachable. And I think one of the more frustrating things about this genre of let's understand these voters is that um, we're not talking about people who are reachable or teachable. I live in rural Indiana most of the time, and, uh, you know, my neighbors are fine. They're nice. They go to work, whatever, but they use the N-word like it means nothing, and every other guy is in the Klan. And, uh, you know, I, there's not a mystery to them. You know, it's, it's not about economic anxiety. It's about the fact that they're really threatened by marriage equality and they're really threatened by the fact that black people can do the exact same things they can and can move in next door to them. And um, I think it's really important to think about how we can extend the conversation to have these hard truths in the public sphere uh, before we can really change anyone's minds. I think we need to make sure people know what the conversation is actually going on and not this sort of fake, let's make ourselves feel better about being evolved conversation. George? 
George, your piece for the New Yorker, I thought, did a masterful job in being uh, empathetic but not uh, unthinkingly so. And you had a great line that you thought Donald Trump's win was about a failure of imagination. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I think the, um, the, the, the people that I met, and this was an interest, it was an interesting time in the campaign because you're hearing a lot of this thing about this, these are basically Steinbeck characters voting for Trump. And then you go to the, the thing, and actually there were uh, a lot of very wealthy people, uh, people who were doing very, very well, uh, who I thought that there was just a kind of an overdose of Fox News. And I think that's maybe one of the big stories is the way that in my lifetime, uh, Fox has displaced everything else as a centrist uh, organization. So people who aren't poli particularly political, they have that on most of the day and, and it becomes this incredible propaganda machine. But I, I think the, the failure of imagination is that there were people who I met who were quite friendly and nice and uh, would kind of trot out, the, there's, a tr there's a series of tropes, you know, he's a successful businessman, you know. That, like, since when was that a thing, you know, that we go get Bill Gates or something, we can, you know. Um, but, but, but there was a series of, of tropes that they would trot out, and what became glaringly obvious was that they weren't able to connect the, the campaign and the dog whistling and the, the racism and the uh, xenophobia with actual people who would be affected by these things. And that was the really frustrating thing. And the closest I got to sort of breakthrough moments was when I could summon up an actual... For example, uh, a young Mexican-American woman who, who, who I'd met, and I could kind of tell the story. And you would see a moment of, of breakdown, you know. Uh, so that's why I say, if you, in, in, I think the beauty of fiction is I can tell you a story about someone who's not in your sphere of influence, and you can have the simulation of actually knowing the person, and it changes you. Uh, I think there was a failure of that. There were, the, the, they weren't imagining that there were victims on the other side of this rhetoric, and that was disappointing, you know. And, and it was doubly disappointing because they weren't people who, the people I met weren't prone to cruelty at all. They, they protested quite the other way. I love everybody. Everybody's my brother. Uh, so you almost thought if I could just pick them up and move them into this room, it might, some percentage of them would have been, uh, I don't know about persuaded, but softened maybe by that, you know. Mm. Or at least just pick them up and shake them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. They're also big, you know. They're, no, 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 no. no I, and I, I just I have a lot of people in my extended family who will over Trump. So for me, it's a, it's a, the, the game I've been playing the whole time is to make this incredibly Willy Wonka-esque machine that you put in 6%, I don't like Hillary, 4%, I watch him, what's Fox News, 3%, I'm a racist. And, you know, you... you, you <laughs> turn the dials and you can always make a Trump supporter come out, you know, <laughs> but, but that, at, at the end, it doesn't, at this point, it doesn't really matter. It's just a sort of an algebra that doesn't, doesn't do any good, I don't think. An everlasting gobstopper of hate. That, that's, yeah. That's <laughs> nice but, but I will say, I do believe in, uh, not persuasion maybe, but softening the borders between people, because I, I heard Zadie Smith on the radio and she said, I think the story was that her uh, in-laws were, they were uh, Brexit people, and, and she said that the way, the way she approaches it is to think of every person as a multiplicity. And sometimes, okay, if, the, if, the, if you're talking politics, that group comes forward and you can't make progress. But she said when they're talking about the grandkids, a different set of, multi, of individuals comes forward. So that's the thing I try to keep in mind is that people are fluid and someone who seems like your enemy on Tuesday and seems intractable the hope is there is, could be some kind of conversion, even if for, for a couple of seconds. But I got zero converts with this method. <laughs> zero converts. <laughs> I think I actually hardened some people's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is a real liberal. What an idiot. You know? <laughs> what a sucker. Yeah. Yeah. Job well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, John, uh, your latest book is in some ways a reflection of uh, a similar phenomenon, which is going and spending time with our very own homegrown basket of deplorables, to use a particularly uh, resonant and possibly precise, possibly imprecise phrase. Um, how much did you have to reserve judgment to make writing the book possible? I mean, these are, these are in many ways, loathsome views being expressed and horrible people, but you seem to go in kind of open. Oh, it's just because, especially, like, just say I go hang out with some neo-Nazis, and they're like offensive to Jews. It's like it's not like it's like what did I expect? It's not like, <laughs> it's not like oh my god, I I can't even. <laughs> they are 
but I, I just found that I don't know, and I guess Pete, you don't know what you don't know until you kind of go out there and you can just find out these things that, oh, didn't occur to you. So one thing in my book, there's a bit about how on the far right, when I turn up to the first rally and I've been promised all these white nationalists and it's all about whiteness, and then I notice that one of the guys from the far right who's up at the back of the ute at this protest and he's trying to, he's going, Aussie, 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 oi, 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 and I can't help but notice he's not a skinhead. You know, he's, uh, I find out he's a Sri Lankan guy and not only that, he's got a very rich accent and it's because he's a recent, a relatively recent immigrant to Australia. And so it's like, hang on, how does that all fit in that he's on the back of this ute and he's standing next to this white nationalist and he's preaching against multiculturalism. And then, I, I mean, the easy answer, if you don't go any further, is just to have this one, it's like, oh, he's trying to be like a white person or whatever. But I kind of, kind of followed him down the rabbit hole because I, I found out he was a pastor and he'd brought a, along his congregation and they were also recent immigrants, a lot of them from a African countries and Asian countries and some Indian people. And... You know, and then I followed him to his church and I spent time with him and he's like a huge, like sincere evangelical Christian who believes that the Messiah is, you know, going to come. It's within our grasp and he's been spoken to by God to, and Islam is a spiritual threat as opposed to a physical threat. And anyway, so, and, and so I just... I hung out with him a lot, and it wasn't like he was faking it, or his congregation was faking it, or whatever. And, and so I, I got to understand that story, and how there's that strand in Australia. And I'd never before spending time with him, and then writing about it, I'd never really heard anyone talk about, well, what's the kind of religious dimension to this kind of far, this new far-right movement, Reclaim Australia? I'd just been told, oh, it's just like Pauline Hanson 20 years ago, and now they've just changed Asians for Muslims, and and... And, and the deeper I got into it, the more I realised there were all these like fascinating strands, and it's almost like insulting to people to not understand their strands. Like another another one being assuming that anyone you know with a turban at these far right rallies, you know, like why are they there? And and the, it, it's not like the first time they heard about Islam was when Pauline Hanson was rabbiting on about them two weeks ago. It's like if you go back to India, you have these storylines that go back hundreds of years before. Pauline Hanson's maiden speech, before, before the White Australia policy, before Captain Cook came to Australia. It's like the, the Sikh community and the Muslim community in India have their own storylines together. And the Hindu community and the Muslim community in India have their own storylines together and their frictions and, and good things and all that stuff like that. And then people immigrate to Australia and those sort of like storylines somehow fuse into this. So... Uh, yeah, and it just seems like it's good, not bad, that sort of like you go out and sort of like try to understand these things. But yeah, yeah. You're a champion of the diversity of the far right. Yes. It's, a, <laughs> it's a complicated position. I'm, I'm so confused by it. Roxanne, one of the things you write about that I really love, that I think is really important and interesting, is about precision of language and about... Uh, one of the great degradations of US politics in the past little while is the way in which language is used uh, unwisely. And um, how much do you take your job as a writer to be the kind of counterweight to that? I take that very seriously because words matter. And I, I think, especially in 2016, we saw people using language in really irresponsible and careless ways. And they weren't doing it out of bad intentions, but particularly on the left. You know, we had all these ridiculous catchphrases like, um, uh, they go low, we go high, which for Michelle Obama makes sense. She's the first lady. But for the rest of us, like, when they go low, we need to fucking grab a shovel and <laughs> go way fucking lower. <laughs> and so uh, I, it just got really frustrating. And then, you know, pantsuits, and everyone was like, oh, pantsuits. <laughs> you know, that's not going to get us to the promised land. And <laughs> so I, and that's why I haven't been writing as much. I'm struggling because words matter. And I think that we need to be really careful 
um, in how we use words and in how we try to move people. And my background, my academic background is actually in rhetoric. And so I, I know how to use words to get people to, to you know, easily believe something. But how do you really reach people and create change with words? And that's something I'm really interested in. And I think that's where we need to be and where we need to be focusing our attention right now because we've seen what carelessness can do. Carelessness allows someone like Donald Trump to be president and it allows people to be very bold and open in their xenophobia and their homophobia and their racism. Uh, and so I'm trying to be very careful with my language. And, you know, I'm not going to always be perfect because I'm me, but um, it, it matters. It matters a lot. But, I mean, it seems to me one of the great tragedies of that is that some, I think carefulness with words matters a great deal, but play and uh, not constantly having to check oneself and, you know, I mean, you are, you're a very good user of Twitter, like your president. <laughs> uh, the two of you are uh, kindred spirits <laughs> in that. Don't ever <laughs> compare my impeccable Twitter account with his. It's, look, <laughs> you have less of a way with an ellipsis than he does. Like true, you don't true. Leave things hanging. But, you know, there is something about that immediacy, about talking to your readers, about being playful, about mm -hmm. uh, responding off the cuff or um, picking fights or talking about pop culture or whatever, that um, if we're on guard because we're seeing how language is being degraded, do we run the risk of not giving ourselves this space to play? No, because it's not about being on guard. It's about being responsible. And I think you can play responsibly. Uh, and I think play is vital. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that we are like all super serious because quite frankly, um, you know, humor is that spoonful of, uh, spoonful of sugar rather to make the medicine go down and to really try and at least get people to listen. Uh, I, but play is integral to everything. And certainly I love playing with language. Um, that's one of the joys of writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. But I also think as writers and as thinkers, we have a responsibility to mean things and to not just think that catchphrases are somehow enough to create change. Um, I think that they allow people to feel good about themselves. Um, and I think it's really connected to what Britt wrote about in her essay about good white people, like, oh, I didn't call the police. Girl, what? <laughs> No, that's nothing. That means you wanted to, you asshole. <laughs> uh, and so if we're more responsible with language, hopefully fewer people will think that empty gestures mean something. They don't. Britt, you wrote a review of Tanahasi Coates' book, and I, I'm interested in that because it, you uh, called to attention the absence of women in his book. And I think it's a really important, really interesting essay. But I know that, r review, I, I know you felt very ambivalent about it, though, because it was a book you admired as well. <laughs> Is I, that hard to do? I mean, yeah, I, I haven't reviewed a lot of books. And this was a book that was a humongous book. Um, and I remember feeling very nervous about writing it, because I knew it wasn't going to be any type of a takedown. Um, but, but I still felt like I was sort of, you know, throwing a pebble at Goliath a little bit with my, with my critique. Um, I mean, and I also, I hate critiques that, that just sort of focus on what something isn't because I find that really unhelpful too. Um, but at the same time, I re remember reading the book and, and just seeing the ways in which he often framed the suffering of black women um, in, in a sense of sort of black women are suffering because they see the pain of black men. And that was a framing that I had heard my entire life. Um, you know, the sense of, oh, well, slavery was actually worse for black men, be you know, because, yeah, black women were raped, but, but they had to watch that happen. So they were the true victims. Um, and Ta-Nehisi Coates does not go that far with his, with his argument, but there was this sort of through line that, I, that I, I noticed in the book, or at least the way I read it, with in the ways in which sort of black women's pain was, was um, kind of uh, only, only sort of had meaning through the suffering of black men. And, and I think that has been one of the, uh, one of the problems of uh, the way that we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, where mo often people will just say the, sh the shooting of unarmed black men. And it is true that disproportionately black men have been killed, but black women are still a victim of police violence all the time. Mm -hmm. Did you get 
um, particular blowback for having a kind of uh, slightly more challenging perspective on it than people might have expected? Uh, no, I was, I was glad about that. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. Um, I saw uh, Shawnee Hilton at BuzzFeed wrote a, um, a review also um, raising some of the similar questions. So I was glad that I was in company of other black women who were kind of like, well, we have this to add. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, this was before my book had come out and I, and I just didn't want to be sort of this, um, you know, this debut writer who was taking a shot at Ta-Nehisi Coates. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I'm glad that, that I think the review had some nuance so p people didn't read it that way. Is that a, I mean, Roxanne, is there a thing when you um, adopt a position that, given that you have such a following who um, hang on your every word, do they expect certain <laughs> things from you? Like, do, you, do they get cross when you zig and when they expect you to zag? Absolutely, it's a lot of pressure. Um, they think because they've read a few essays that they know my opinion about everything. And so when I have an opinion that doesn't fall in line with what they think feminist doctrine should be, should be or when I just say something like that they don't agree with, trust me, they hear it. In fact, <laughs> oh my God, every day it's so shitty. Today, <laughs> I got an email from a woman who was at my event in New Zealand and she was like, I was at the microphone and we ran out of time, but I need to be heard on these four points. Oh my God. <laughs> four points. <laughs> yes, and she gave me the list and I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, I needed to be heard. Like, girl, if you want to be heard, write a book. I mean, and, and so it's really hard because I'm really grateful for my following because it, it, it's gratifying to write and then have that work well received and to know that there's an audience and to know that you can do something meaningful as a writer. That's the gift. I'm living the dream. But at the same time, it's frustrating that people want to nail you down like a butterfly, like, like pin you to this display board. And when you step out of line, they get very angry. And that's frustrating because I, I determine the line, not you. And uh, so I, I, it's something I'm mindful of. And I, I try not to give in and to like just be a robot who's doing what people want. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, I, I'm just a happy robot myself. George, I know that... Uh, I read that there was an old review of yours that stayed with you um, that was a largely negative review, but it had a line in it that was, Saunders writes better out of love than anger. Yeah. And it stayed with you as a line. Why did that resonate when you read I, it? I don't know. It was a, a very negative review, and that was the, that was the nicest thing in there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes I think we, the, um, for review positive or negative, I think you just sort of open yourself up to it, let it hit you. And then, you know, you do whatever you have to do, and then a few things will stick that are helpful. And that one, um, I was in a, a period, this was during the, the Iraq War, and I was doing a lot of kind of political writing that I felt was less interesting than my fiction, but I felt compelled to do it. And I was writing out of anger. And when I read that review, I thought, yeah, one of, the, one of the things an artist has to reserve is the right to do whatever the hell she wants. And also, the, you have to reserve the right of art to be useless, which is hard to do in a time like this, to say, I'm, I, I reserve the right to make a book that has nothing to do with the political situation. That's, you know, and, and there's a critic named Dave Hickey who said um, that when we, when we fall into this uh, trap of saying what art should do. It's just one step to the reactionary coming and saying, oh, this is what art must do. And then yours isn't doing it, so please you know, go to the gulag. So I think part of, part of the game is to say, um, I, I want to write in the way that sort of elevates my artistic self. In this case, I found that if I can summon up affection for an imaginary person, I write better, actually. I write funnier. I actually write more in a more edgy way if, I, if the first move is one of curiosity and some form of love, even if the person is pretty horrible. Uh, and I think that's just a tick. You know, I don't think there's anything universal about it, but uh, Flannery O'Connor says you can choose what you write, but you can't choose what you make live. So that's, you know, the first burden is you have to make your prose fill up with light by whatever means necessary. And that reviewer just reminded me that when I go out to nail somebody, my work is less interesting than if I set out to, uh, say, like or love somebody. So is 
anger useful for your work in any way? Not really, not really. What I have to do is, you know, really, there's, in Buddhism, there's a thing called idiot compassion, which is where you're like, oh, you drove a spike through my head. That must be hard for you. Thank you for making the coat rack. You know, that, uh, and I have a tendency towards that, which is a personality defect because I don't like conflict, you know. So that means that I have to watch it. I, sometimes I can be um, so enthralled by my own empathy that the that I'm actually under-describing the character. I'm, I'm giving a free pass when a, a more m mindful uh, approach would make the character pop more, you know? So I think that's something I, I just know about myself, that I have to, um, if sometimes, in other words, sometimes I have to simulate anger to get the correct level of specificity to make the true moral, I, I think, the, the, in, to my way of thinking, in fiction, and maybe in nonfiction, the best way to make meaning is through an elaborate system of contradictions so you say this about A, and then you come over and say a slightly different thing, and then the third thing, and then the supreme artist just goes, that's it. You know, Chekhov, for me, Chekhov is somebody who does that. And he, he doesn't do the, he doesn't put his finger on the scale, but he just makes a complex reality and says, isn't it like that sometimes? And so, if, so sometimes for that to happen, I have to simulate a little bit of pissed off quality. Which, believe me, I can get very pissed off. I'm very <laughs> No. <laughs> so, so the responsibility of the artist is to the art. I th I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that you now all the stuff we're talking about, empathy and uh, causing change. I don't think it happens if the reader closes the book and walks away. So, although we, you know, I think a lot of writers are political animals. That they're essentially you. You didn't get the microphone because you were political. You got the microphone because you were charming in prose or whatever, persuasive or energetic in prose. So, mm. you know. But one of the things that characterizes the mothers is it seems to me to be at its heart a book about good people or people who want to do good or be good. Uh, how much did you go into it with that as kind of part of the story you wanted to tell? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I like stories like that. I mean, that's when, I, like, I love Parks and Rec um, as a TV show because... It's inherently about people who are, who are trying to be good. And, um, and I think as I started writing the book, I don't think it began that way. I think um, there were a lot of characters that I initially was not sympathetic toward at all. But I think sort of what George was saying, I had to kind of do that, that work of looking at that person and all their contradictions and seeing what was really complicated about everybody. And you know, the sense that it, you know, everyone is sort of the hero of their own story. So even the characters that are terrible, they can justify why they're terrible. Um, so for me, it ha I had to do that work of sometimes just writing pages in the point of view of this person and, and thinking about their life and figuring out how they came to be the way that they were. Um, and even if the end result is not really this heroic arc, um, I wanted the characters just to be compli uh, complicated people. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that you said that you felt like they were all trying to be good. Um, but, but, yeah, I really wanted them just to be complex. Roxanne? Please shoot me down if you think this is an unfair characterization. But your fiction seems darker to me than lots of your nonfiction. Like, even though your nonfiction is dealing with um, often difficult, complex, distressing ideas, you allow yourself more levity, it seems to me, in your essays than you do in your stories. I think it depends. You know, I think that whenever a woman writes about difficult subjects, she's called dark. And, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, as much as there is darkness in my fiction, there's also hope and light. You can't have one without the other. And in most of my fiction, you have characters, and mostly women, who are trying to find something better for themselves. And they're oftentimes coming from a place where they've been through something challenging. Uh, I think it's easier... I prefer to be dark in my fiction or just true because that's what calls to me. And that's where I find the most exhilarating stuff to write. Um, and I write for myself, first and foremost. With my nonfiction, I, the world is a dark and complicated place, but we already know that. And I don't think we need to be beaten over the head with that. And so I do use a lot of levity and humor and play in my nonfiction, uh, simply because the world is hard enough and we don't need to make it harder. Um, so, yeah. Mm. 
I sh should be clear, in your fiction, beyond it being dark, the darkness is about, uh, there's great beauty, like it, it seems important to you to show the kind of capacity for beauty in people. Do you feel like that's a part of the artistic project for you, that, that without that, there's less point? Yeah, definitely. I think what I'm really exploring is just the depth of what people endure and what life looks like uh, for different people. I'm always interested in the lives of others. I'm super curious and, you know, whenever I meet someone, I file away bits and pieces about them and uh, they just build and build in my head and sometimes in a file on my computer called um, beginnings and endings. I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, and um, I start to take pieces from this file in my head and on my laptop and think about, okay, who is the person who has this quirky thing and how did they come to that place and what have they been through and who do they love and how have they been hurt and what do they want most? And I think all of that is beautiful. I think looking at life and in its best and its worst forms can be just gorgeous. And I love the ability to write that. That's just why I do it. Um, it's just so joyful. Mm -hmm. As weird as that sounds, like, hey, here's a story about a kidnapping. I had a lot of fun writing it. <laughs> <laughs> But, I've met some kids. That, you know, yeah. <laughs> sometimes things happen. Yeah. Um, but it's just being able to tell a story and take my own breath away uh, lets me know I'm on the right track. So Roxanne writes first for herself. John, who's your ideal reader for your books? Who's your ideal audience? Because my stuff seems so sarcastic. It seems like, like I'm a misanthrope or something, but I really don't imagine that when I'm writing. I always imagine like someone reading it and laughing and <laughs> connecting to it. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I, I imagine in my head. And uh, just picking up on some things that have been, been said, uh, I, I, I think sort of like to write, it's, like, it's kind of like hard to micromanage things and sort of to say, well... I'm going to write more literally about issues and that's somehow going to be more effective than kind of winging it a bit. A bit. Like, you know, would Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, would that have been better if you mentioned Richard Nixon more times than, I don't know, going to the, the, the sort of the roulette wheel or whatever? Like, it's just like all, all these things are just so hard to contain and pre-plan and manage. So it, so it is kind of good as a writer to sort of trust yourself and trust, like for instance, in my case with humour, I just trust that if I'm finding something funny or ironic, it's like there's meaning behind it. And when I'm writing it, I don't sort of like beat myself over the head trying to figure out why, how to justify putting it in there. And, and so often, once it's all done, sort of like something kind of fits into a bigger picture, but, but I, I, I never would have put it in in the first place had I sort of like thought about it too hard. I'm thinking, like in my new book, I go to interview this rabbi, and when I get there, he's on the phone and he's screaming on the phone because it's Passover, this Jewish festival when you're not allowed to eat wheat, and he's just discovered that there may be a wheat byproduct in his antibiotics that he's been taken. And he's sort of like, and he's screaming at the chemist or whatever, and I just thought, oh, are these funny? Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I just put it in there and like, even though it's not part of the interview and I don't really know what, why it just seems funny to me. And then like later in the, in the overall story, like so much of the book, a the theme is about, you know, you know, religious literalism and sort of like, yeah, and, and so sort of like taking scripture seriously and what, what that means, is it dangerous or whatever. And then so in the, in the bigger picture, that thing that I just put in because it was like funny, kind of like feeds into clearly what my subconscious <laughs> was, was trying to say. The, the new book does pivot, though, from... It's a very funny book, but it's, it feels like you're quite deliberately wanting the reader to be disturbed by the Australia they see in it. Yes. That the, it's hard not to reach a conclusion that we're in a pretty dark place at the moment. And was that a conscious shift in register, or was I just in a bad mood? No, no, no. I, I really felt... 
my impulse and what I like to do, like create something disorienting where people are like, what the hell? You know, like, you know, when people watch, saw me on TV 20 years ago and suddenly I'm outside Ray Martin's house and, and I'm having a fight with this famous guy and it's like, not the, pol like the whole thing's just so weird and then I get exercise on TV. It's like, what the hell's going on? And I really felt that thing that I love, this kind of um, disorienting thing where is, is like what's floating through Australia and the world definitely, but Australia at the moment where just because of all these things, you know, like suddenly Trump's elected and that's like really weird and, and then we're hearing about terrorist attacks and then just and everyone not knowing how to talk about it. It seems like everything's just you know, in this state where like it, it's like Australia's kind of now synced up with the, that, that sort of like disorienting thing that sort of like I, I like to create. So I, I definitely did in this book think, oh, I can make that super relevant. And there's this Aussie film, which I'd never seen before, but I'd heard about, called Wake in Fright from the 70s. And I, I just happened to watch that as I was starting to write this book. And it's like a city slicker. It's from the 70s, isn't it? And he kind of like wakes up in, uh, in outback Australia where everyone's like super friendly as Aussies because it's that Aussie way. But there's always like, my God, at any moment, just because of alcohol and just because of you know, the pressure to fit in, like, these people could turn on you and, like, it could go really violent. And I, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll sort of do a, re a remake of that with this. <laughs> and that's because that seems like what Australia is at, at the moment. So, so it, absolutely, that kind of level was uh, conscience. Wake and fright, 2017. <laughs> uh, I imagine out there in the darkened theatre, there are many of you with questions for the people on the stage. Yeah, I was terrified. I ran down here from the back row because I thought I was going to be the woman sending my four points through. <laughs> um, but my question is, uh, the present feels kind of a bit terrifying, increasingly uninhabitable. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about the future. Like, is there hope in the darkness? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was having a talk with a friend uh, after the election, and uh, she said, well, very sweetly, she's older, and she said, just, I, I was there the year that Robert Kennedy and Dr. King were killed, within the same year. And she said, so the world has always been crazy, and I think that, for me, the biggest enemy of a progressive mindset right now is that we are, I think, a little spoiled, maybe. So, there's, we've, I mean, in my lifetime, there hasn't been any real knock on wood, catastrophic things. So when, it, when something happens, we might be inclined to think it's the first time. And I think that's fine for a while, but then it, be, it, it becomes our enemy if despair uh, shuts us down. So I, I, I have a lot of hope. I mean, there's, things are still beautiful and people are still good and I, I think it's all right, you know, we can, but if, only if you fight, you know, if you fight and insist that truth is truth, cruelty is cruelty, Oppression is oppression. None of that has changed, and so uh, people who would show up in an event like this have a great responsibility to believe that that life is still beautiful and insist that it be so. I think you know. You historically have written a lot of things set in the future, and yet your first novel uh, is resolutely set in the past. Is that an impulse against the time? Are you? Is no, there anything I, no, deliberate, or it's just? No, I, just, I heard a great story 20 years ago that I really wanted to tell that happened to be in 1862, so I just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else on optimism? No, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, th thank you. It, it's Monday, you people have to get through the week, so don't, don't let this bring you down too much. We're gonna take a question over this side. Um, you're all people that we read for insight into how the world is and how it might be. Who, would you, who else would you all recommend that we read? Like, who, who do you get insight from, either fiction or non-fiction? Well, I think um, a friend of mine, Gia Tolentino, who writes for the New Yorker website, um, I think she has uh, written some really great pieces sort of capturing uh, the political mood in America right now, um, perhaps it's not very optimistic or hopeful, but I think she is the smartest person writing online right now, and everybody should read her. I'm a big fan of Samantha Irby, who writes, on the surface it seems like it's humor, but she actually does some really beautiful engagement with a lot of complex issues, including poverty and 
race and bodies. And so I love Samantha Irby's work. Um, I didn't like really grow up like reading the classics. I like just yeah, mucked around at school and everything. And just, but and, and my whole reading happened up, you know, university onwards. I started reading, reading. But even then, I'd read like the latest books or whatever. And it's only been quite recently, like just for the hell of it almost, like going back to the classics. And it's amazing how many of them are classics for a reason, you know? <laughs> so, and you just learn things about like humans and. <laughs> and why, how humans act. They're like, I just read Crime and Punishment, and it's amazing, you know. And it, <laughs> there's a reason everyone talks about it. And so, and you just, you just learn stuff from the classics, and maybe there's a bigger strike rate if um, going back to old books, because they're classic for a reason. I would also say one of the lovely things out of the US election was how great so much of the writing was. Like, that, that seems like a banal point to make in a way when it's happening in response to grief and fear and uh, all these terrible things. But some of, the, some of the journalism that was out there was uh, made it the most compulsive soap opera possible. That's luxury from this side of the planet, but uh, there was some really good reading to be had. We're going to go over here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Centre for introducing me to these people because I've never really heard of any, except for John. Um, <laughs> so I, I look forward to, when I leave, looking up and finding some of your stuff because um, I've appreciated what you shared tonight. Um, the question I really have is about, um, when, I live here in Australia and I've been here for 15 years. And when I see the election and I see what people talk about Trump, it's always through the, the veil of racism or or, or hatred or something like that, and this is how he got elected. There were these angry, angry, you know, angry people against the other. And I just wondered, did, did any of you know or seen where people have really written from a viewpoint of, like they said about Obama, you know, black people came out because he was black and he voted for him. Has anyone really explored the fact that there, Trump is president because a lot of white people voted him in, and that's just the way it is. And I know it's a dynamic because they're the majority, but it's people, have people actually written about that in a very serious examination, like I've seen with race and, and otherism? Yes. Um, I think there's been a lot of extensive writing exploring whiteness as the culprit for why Trump was elected. Um, I don't know that it's good writing, but I think it has been covered quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, I mean, th there is in, in the narrative of that election outcome, there are questions about, about race, about colour, but also obviously about gender mm. and about class. Um, are there, do you feel any close? I know in the immediate aftermath of the election, you felt very reluctant to do too much uh, analysis, because it was all a bit too raw and a bit too immediate. Do you feel more reconciled with it, or is it, have you put it in a box over there and it's best not to? Well, I don't know that it's in a box, but, you know, <clears throat> it's a little shocking to me that we're still writing about how did he get elected seven months later. Um, I think that we need to move the conversation forward to how do we get him uh, not elected in 2020. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are the things that we need to be doing between now and then? I think, um, to be fair, he's doing a pretty good job at it. Himself. Yes, he yeah. is. <laughs> I mean, it's such a gift. I've been so cheerful this week because, like, wow, way to talk yourself out of a job, man. Uh, it's hard. I'm tired. Like, he's taking a nap right now. Um, you know, I, I think the analysis was necessary and important, but the key things that we should have been talking about from the analysis, like that the median income of Trump voters was $55,000, which is not working class, and that 53% um, of white women voted for Trump, um, I know. Uh, is we you know we 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 need to do more with that than just recite these statistics over and over, but not really look at what they mean. But I'm personally no longer interested in litigating the 2016 election because it's over, and we have to really look at what the Trump administration is doing, um, not only in the United States but globally, and think about ways in which we can stem the damage because he and his administration are a menace. 
Uh, and so that's kind of where I'm trying to focus my conversation. I'm going to write one piece um, about, uh, it's for the times, and it's about things we no longer have because Obama is no longer president. And that's really all I'm going to say about it, because I, we have to be looking forward and thinking about the uh, midterms in 2018 and who's going to run in 2020, and quite honestly, how can we get a woman elected in the United States? A, a qualified woman. But Hillary was qualified. Sorry. <laughs> I want to sit here silently and see if you keep adding to that sentence just a little bit more. It feels like it's coming along. I think we went that side then, so we're over here. Uh, in, I've been to America just once, and it seems to they spoke a lot more about racial politics very openly than we do. And I think um, part of the reason maybe a few of us listen to John is that he often is very open in discussing religion and race directly with people, which we don't seem to do here much. And the online culture at the moment seems to very much be discussing identity politics and things. Is, is there a relationship between that and then people voting right wing, or do we feel that that's the reaction which will just happen for a short term, and then maybe we'll go back once people obviously see how crap Trump is and all the rest. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I've heard that sort of conversation. I, to me, it's sort of in line with this argument of talking about race is what makes racism happen. You know, <laughs> the sense that that is the causal link, um, which, you know, I, I think it's, frustra it's frustrating to me. I think even just the idea of there being politics that are not about identity, I don't understand that as, as a concept. Um, you know, a lot of these things that are considered identity politics, um, you know, I heard someone throw out marriage equality in that category, and it's, like, marriage equality, that's an economic issue that, you know, it, it's not just about sort of identity categories. Um, so I don't know. I think that a lot of the Trump thing, I do think it is a backlash often to that conversation of the people who feel like if we just didn't talk about race, racism would go away. Um, I also just think it's a backlash to having a black president. I don't think it's any coincidence that what all that Trump has done so far has, has basically been to undo Obama's legacy. Um, you know, I don't think it's any coincidence that people, you know, people who love the Affordable Care Act somehow hate Obamacare. Um, and, you know, Trump has promised that he's going to get rid of Obamacare and give him something better. Um, to me, it just seems like this sort of concerted effort of a large percentage of white people to sort of erase the fact that we ever had a black president. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it, there's much that's mystifying about the U.S. political context for us, I think. But the, the way in which certain topics are immediately a hot-button thing... Uh, in ways that exceeds our experience here is really interesting to me. And I wanted to ask about the response you've had to opening your novel with an abortion and the fact that that's not something that's just a narrative detail or something that happens to a character. That's, that's read in the US much more as a kind of positioning statement almost. Yeah, I mean, it's something that was not a controversial choice to me when I was writing the book. Um, and I've been encouraged that as I've gone around the country, I mean, I've, I read in places like New York, and they also sent me to Wichita, Kansas. Um, and I remember being, like, when I got to Kansas, starting to feel a little bit nervous for the first time um, about the fact that I was reading this abortion novel in Kansas. Um, but I was encouraged that the way that regular people reacted to the book was not the type of political discourse you see um, on TV, and people had such complex reactions um, to the book um, that didn't reflect the sort of dichotomy of you have to be pro-choice or you have to be pro-life. Um, I think the most interesting thing to me was that I got a lot of blowback from the left of people who felt like the novel was not sufficiently pro-choice um, because the character continued to think about the abortion throughout her life. And to me, that was just telling because that, uh, you know, I understood it in the sense of you know, regret, that's kind of a, an argument that's used to manipulate women or used to sort of say, you know, no woman should be able to access abortion because you'll regret it. Um, so people were sort of reacting to this argument they thought I was making, and, and to me that also, it was sort of sad to, to think of how dire abortion rights are in the United States where people have that knee-jerk reaction to anything that seems like it might be sort of tamping down on, on abortion rights. I do like the description, abortion novel. I hope there's a section in Borders, which is abortion <laughs> novels, because I think that'd be a good thing. That disconnect, though, between the idea of how people respond and what their responses are reduced to in media is really interesting. I mean, you were talking about Fox News before, George, and you have a great 
SAN branded megaphone about the role that kind of media plays. Yeah. Is it, can you avoid it? Can you live in a bubble and not be aware of it? Or do you try and uh, regularly expose yourself to what other people are watching? Oh, no, I do try. I think, well, I, actually, the other thing that we haven't talked about tonight is the, 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 the degradation of education in the last 30 years. So when you watch Fox News, uh, if you're well-educated, you can spot the Orwellian moves, and, and you can, you've, they, they jump out at you. If you're not, it sounds like persuasive rhetoric. So I think that's one of the, I mean, the, the rise of the right-wing media, I think, is the, along with income inequality, I think those are the two uh, kind of uh, factors that have changed American politics. And so I think, you know, if you, if you uh, are well-educated and you, with a respect for language, uh, also, you know, the other thing that I, I find in like our talk about, about identity, the, their, uh, the basis for America is pretty good, you know, all beings are created equal. That's a radical idea. We've never come close to living into it. And now I think, I like to think this is the death throes of the resistance to that. In other words, when people talk about um, same-sex marriage, they talk about race, they talk about any of these things, they're kicking and screaming. And what they're kicking and screaming against is the, is the Constitution. It's, that is a very spiritual document. It says that there's no reality to any of these apparent differences except when we commodify them and try to enforce them with oppression. That's, that's an idea that's very radical. And when you have a population, uh, a, a, a white privileged population that's always gone along floating on that cloud and now has to come out and say, oh, we really do mean everybody. We really do mean everybody is luminous and perfect and, and equal, then you're, you're getting, I think, the last holdouts against that. Now, it, as we're seeing, it's a very powerful, <laughs> it's a very powerful th thing to surrender. You know, but, but ultimately, I think it's, it's a, I went to a Bernie Sanders rally when I was covering this thing, and it was like a beautiful dream. You know, they, they were, everybody was there and happy. They were literally dancing in the aisles. And it was the only speech I've ever heard where I just, the whole two hours, I went, yep, yep. Yeah, you know, sometimes you hear a politician, you go, e yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this was a, a man who really understood that the, the, the American principle is incredibly radical and it's spiritual and it's the only way to go. We, we can't make a distinction between people by these categories. We have to honor everybody 100%. And mm. That's the only, the only route. You know. You'll be fine on the education front because Betsy DeVos has got it. She's fine. She's yeah. really yeah. going to yeah, improve yeah. education in your country. No <laughs> There's a question over this side. Thank you. Um, I'm feeling a bit rude because my question actually was directed to one of the writers, but I guess I could open it up to everyone after I ask Roxanne. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. When I, when I read your book, uh, Bad Feminist, I thought a lot about self-portraiture and I felt like you really put the lens back on yourself in a lot of ways and discussed and explored things about yourself that were scary and, and painful. And, and I wondered as a feminist um, how you have found the experience of, of doing that and, and what it's been like. And, and did, did it free you of some of the things or did it, are you still not, not affected but was it a release or was it a not release or how, how is that? P.S. I love you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <Sorry>. you. <laughs> uh, you're very kind. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I struggled a lot with... One of the reasons I put off writing nonfiction for so long is because I have long resented the notion that as a woman, the only thing you're allowed to be an authority on is yourself. At the same time, I realized I was not writing just because I like, was being stubborn and didn't want to prove like, that this thing is a thing. But um, when I wrote from myself and when I write from myself, it's because whatever argument I'm trying to make demands it. And it, it, it is useful. I, I can't pretend it's not, but it's not therapeutic. Uh, I, I go to my therapist for therapy. Um, and I think writing is what happens afterward. <laughs> and I'm like, I have all the answers now. Uh, <laughs> but I, it's definitely helped me, quite honestly, writing about myself when needed has helped me gain confidence and has helped me um, continue to believe that I deserve to narrate the world as I see it, that my viewpoint matters, 
because uh, you know for so long I thought it didn't and and then I just started writing and I didn't know if anyone was going to care but um, I just did it anyway and then people seemed to, to like it. Uh, one of the challenges I've found is that um, people expect me to be the same person I was eight years ago for example when I wrote most of the essays in Bad Feminist and I'm 42 now. I'm much older. I'm in a different place in almost every single way. Uh, and so the, one of the challenges is um, how do I let people know that I've evolved? I don't disavow anything. I, I love Bad Feminist, quite honestly. It's the book that bought my car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I also hope that my readers are willing to come along with me as I continue to grow as a writer and thinker. Thank you. <laughs> Over this side. Hello. Um, I have a sense that my question might be a bit provocative, but uh, I hope that uh, I mean it in the most, uh, with a, in a sense of curiosity and um, openness. But uh, Whoa, I would scary have, setup. I would have. I, <laughs> I was um, just Roxanne. What you said before, the notion of um, Hillary Clinton being a qualified woman. Um, mm -hmm. I would have I would have potentially um, described the last election as a failure of identity politics that it wasn't enough to um, maybe explain the things that are happening in the world um, and that while Hillary Clinton is a qualified woman she's also a woman of power of like the aristocracy um, and I feel like a class-based politics is coming uh, back a little bit in how people talk about it and how people are trying to understand it. Um, and I just wonder whether, how you all see um, a materials politics, uh, how you see its place in um, modern America and uh, how you might use it or not to explain the world you're in. Well, I, I mean, I, I I think, um, you know, I think it's really important to talk about class. I think what is frustrating me about that conversation is class is often conflated with whiteness um, in the sense of the sort of work, white working class voters. Like, I'm fascinated by this Vir West Virginia coal miner that has been summoned as a sort of stand-in for this, like, uh, rustic white masculinity. Uh, I remember reading online, somebody was talking about how in West Virginia there are three times as many black people who live there than coal miners. But nobody is talking about black West Virginians and who represents their interests. Everybody's talking about the West Virginia coal miner. Um, so I think, you know, I think um, talking about class is, is really important, but I think there's also a way in which it becomes a standard for whiteness or even, you know, Bernie Sanders, um, you know, recently. Um, was criticized because he supported an anti-abortion candidate who he considered progressive. Um, and he said, you know, well, we can't really have this purity test. We have to be very pragmatic. And we don't always, you know, people might not agree with us on every issue, but we should still support them, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, I don't understand how you can be for economic justice if you don't support reproductive rights. Because, again, that's an economic issue. You know, you can't control your economic future if you cannot determine when and if you are pregnant, right? Uh, but the idea of that not being an economic issue because that's a women's issue or that's an identity issue, you know, I think that, that, that's what I think what frustrates me just about that conversation is because I think class, at least in the ways in which it is voked now, nobody's talking about the black working class and what their interests are. You know, it, it becomes a stand-in for race in this really uncomfortable way. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when people say, why don't we lead with class, we can't look at any aspect of identity in isolation. That's not how life works. You're never just marked by class or gender or race and ethnicity or sexuality or ability. You have to look at the whole thing. And, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was an elitist, sure. We can go there. But uh, was she, I mean, c compared to a billionaire? Like, yeah. <laughs> how is this a thing? Like, that yeah. she's still excoriated. Um, look, to be frank, there is not one single person in American politics that isn't part of the elite because mm -hmm. it is so expensive. It generally costs now around a billion dollars to run for president in the United States. Senate races cost anywhere from 
three million to a hundred million dollars. I mean, these are absurd amounts. And so we really have to rethink the entire political system if we really want to have a class-based revolution. Um, but when people bring up Hillary Clinton as this sort of devil um, figure, this person who represents everything that's wrong with materialism, you are overlooking every single white man who has been in politics from the beginning of time. And that's absurd. There is a question up here. I take it on good authority. Ah. Hello. Um, my question is for everyone, but I want to talk about um, Roxanne's point earlier. You, sorry, um, you made a really great point that I absolutely agree with, that writers need to be responsible with their language and precise um, because catchphrases don't create change, you know, in the pants, hashtag pantsuits kind of era. <laughs> but it's interesting because those catchphrases and I guess the way politics has evolved has meant that there's this new, newly politically active generation, particularly in the States, who respond very well to um, hashtags and um, viral videos. And it seems that more people than ever before um, are entitled uh, feel entitled to write and have a voice and have platforms to write with. And I guess arguably you could say, many people would say that the last election um, was a failure of language and a failure of truth telling. Um, so I wonder whether the panel feels like beyond being precise and being truthful and being committed to precise language, there is a greater responsibility now than ever before to be creative and to be persuasive or that to, to be different than we've had to be before? And if so, what is that challenge? Roxanne. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think there's a responsibility to be creative uh, and to think about language and persuasion in new ways without abandoning uh, the methods that we've historically used that have worked. You know, this. We often talk about this new generation of like hashtags, virality, so on and so forth. I teach college, and um, you know these things are true, but it's a gateway, and it's a question of okay, if we get someone's attention with a hashtag, what do we do to capitalize on it? What do we do to sort of lead people um, in? And it's kind of the same way with feminism that it can't just be hashtag feminism. Um, and it, or celebrity feminism, like, oh, Taylor Swift is your feminist icon. Okay, great. Um, here's a book. And uh, I, I think we have to think of that, of, of creating social change in the same way. Uh, um, but creativity is absolutely key because uh, we're going to have to really outthink the enemy on everything that we're looking at right now. Right now, someone in the audience is tweeting, Roxanne just slammed Taylor. You're in yeah. trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. Oh, that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's already yeah. happened. That's done. Go ahead. I mean, her music is great, but girl, your feminism is shallow as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> George, you, you teach writing. I don't want to weigh in on Taylor right now. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, George. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hashtag gutless. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you teach writing. Are you, um, your students, are they more politicised now than they have been in previous years? Do you yes. find yes. they want to make a difference with their writing in a way they might not have in the past? Yeah, I think, I think maybe they feel more uh, struck by how difficult that is. You know, maybe a little... I mean, you know, what I was thinking about language, and think about that phrase, make America great again. Mm. That is an amazingly diabolical phrase. And it's, and it, but it's unpacked beautifully. America was great, you remember when. Mm -hmm. Remember, brother? <laughs> you know, that, that's the <laughs> subtext. But I didn't see, I, until late, I didn't see a nice takedown of that, of that phrase. And by that time, it was already in a million homes and people were, and, and it, it lands on people in so many different ways. What, whenever you think the American racial nostalgia's dream is, you go right there even in spite of the fact that it did never exist, and in spite of the fact that when America was great, there was a bunch of people suffering. So, so that's, a, um, that's why I say a failure of education, because in a more articulate culture, we would have called that shit out right away. But it took us about four months. And the other thing I, that I think is uh, really scary, and I don't hear it discussed that much, 
is the way that the, um, so, so at some point in our history, the uh, news media changed function. Now, when I was a kid, it was always boring and it was short. And the networks didn't want to do it because it was a loss leader. They, they were forced to do it for an hour a night. Then it switched and suddenly it's a profit center. So you have 12 hours of programming to accommodate six minutes of news. What do you fill it up with? Gossip, innuendo, speculation, stupidity. Um, when yeah. Trump came on the scene, my wife and I were watching this kind of dazzled that they would, they would broadcast 40-minute news conferences that, that he... Why? Well, now we know why, because the head of CNN told us it was an incredible boom for ratings. So that's, that's a worm that is going to take some, some work to kill. In other words, if, you, if I can stimulate you with whatever, you will get on TV. And, that, and intelligence doesn't tend to have that effect. <laughs> so I, I think that's something, and I, I have no, no solutions whatsoever, because that, that is a, it's in the capitalist system, it's hugely profitable, and it's gonna keep rolling until something stops it, and I don't know what will stop it. Mm -hmm. So yes, optimistic. You've been very patient over here. Um, I'm fortunate that my question follows on, on quite neatly from the previous one. Um, obviously one of this evening's themes has been truth, and George, Roxanne, and Britt especially, you've all spoken about how you write both fiction and non-fiction. And I've often felt that fiction can be the most effective way to tell the truth, even more so than non-fiction often. And I wonder if you would care to comment on that or if you agree or disagree. Uh, sure, um, that's a, yeah, you know, I oftentimes, I teach actually both fiction and nonfiction as well, and I often tell my students that fiction is tr the truth. It is about telling the truth, uh, and it's about telling the truth artfully, uh, but so is nonfiction. It's just different ways of getting at the truth. I, I think that fiction is very effective in getting the truth across, and it, it does a lot towards empathy and allowing people to imagine the lives of others um, because it's couched in a story. And yet, um, when you look at sales, nonfiction does exponentially better than fiction for almost every writer. And I think that's because people, for whatever reason, seem to have some sort of distrust of fiction, even though it does a lot of great work if you open yourself up to it. But when people see nonfiction, they really feel like they're getting to the, the, the ultimate truth of something and that they're really learning something vital uh, that they can trust. And so as a writer, I believe that truth can come out in either way. And honestly, I love using fiction for getting at truth, um, but I, I don't know that the general reading public agrees. Yeah, and I think also, um, you know, there, there are some moments that, are, that things happen in real life, and if you wrote it in fiction, no one would believe. Um, so I know like for the Good White People essay, I wrote about how my, my father worked for the district attorney's office and was pulled over by cops and had a gun put to his head. And I didn't mention this, I think, in the essay, but his, his father, my grandpa, was a police officer. And the, all of those series of coincidences in a novel, people might have been like, okay, this is a little on the nose, but, but it's one of these things that really happen. And, and I think it, that gave the piece some power um, um, in a way that if it, people might have been skeptical of it as sort of contrived if it were in fiction. Yeah. One, one thing I really love about fiction is, is the idea that you could um, in, in energetically impersonate someone with whom you disagree, make them come alive, uh, summon that part of yourself that you really aren't proud of even, then you put that person on their feet and you come over and make their opponent in three dimensions, and then you make somebody who doesn't understand the whole thing, put her in the, in the story, and suddenly you get a kind of a system of contradictions that is speaking truth that you didn't even know you knew at the beginning. That, that to me, with, with nonfiction, I feel like I kind of go into it with an idea, and if I'm lucky, you know, you go in the Trump campaign with a set of ideas. If you're lucky, reality overturns those ideas, and that's kind of wonderful. But with fiction, I love that you could be anybody you can imagine, 100%, even if they're a real idiot, which a lot of my inner selves are, put, put them out there and then say, oh, that's not me. That's Murray, you know. And, and, then, and then it can make, you can make a world that's more complicated than you could imagine at any point in time. And that's a really, it, in, a, in other words, you don't have to be as dumb as you normally are. You know, by revision, you can actually make a, a smarter, kind of better self on, on the page, which is a plus, I think. I think 
possibly the greatest truth we've heard tonight is that George Saunders' inner idiot is called Murray, <laughs> um, which seems like a good name for an inner idiot, if ever there was one. I take great comfort that my world is shaped and defined and described by the four people on the stage uh, with me tonight. They, um, honestly, I could have followed every question with the words, P.S., I love you a lot, <laughs> to all four of them. I think you'll join me in those sentiments. Big round of applause. Visit realcentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.